Good afternoon and welcome to the Security Seminar, the Serious Security Seminar from Purdue University. Our speaker today is Mark Guido from a Serious Partner Company, the MITRE Corporation. They've been a partner with Serious since way back in the 1990s before Serious was actually formed, back in the days of the Coast Lab. So a long uh, and continuing fruitful relationship with MITRE and Purdue. Um, today he's going to talk about a project that uh, he ran here with one of our PhD students, Eric Katz, uh, last year. The project is called the Mobile Masquerading Experiment. So uh, Mark, take it away. All right, thank you. All right, so um, I'm going to talk about the, the MITRE Purdue Mobile Masquerading Experiment. And let me just jump right into here. Um, as an agenda, after a brief introduction uh, where I will introduce MITRE, um, I'll talk about our, our research and, and what we were actually experimenting on. Um, then I'll talk about the, the experiment. We'll talk about our data collection, what we did actually on the campus using uh, human subject volunteers. And then, um, and then I'll talk about our analysis that, that is still going on right now. And finally, we'll end with uh, my conclusions. Um, the, uh, and at any point, if you guys want uh, to ask me questions, um, just fire away. Okay, so um, the MITRE Corporation is, is, is a, an industry partner of, of Sirius. Uh, what we do is we run federally funded research and development centers, and I have our, currently our six that are listed there um, in various aspects of, of the government. Um, and we're, we actually might be adding another one very soon, so um, hopefully there'll be seven that I have to put on here. Um, we have a, a rich research program. It's actually called the MITRE Innovation Program, um, and it's millions and millions of dollars of research. Um, this actually fits into what is called an inv innovation area, the cybersecurity innovation area um, uh, that, that fits into the, uh, the MIP. So let me give you a, 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 just a timeline. Um, so I was here uh, back in 2012, and I spoke at, at one of these in October. And that's really where we, we started the, the collaboration. Um, so I was talking back um, at, at, in 2012, and, and I'll, I'll discuss what we were talking about. It's actually the same research project, although our motivations and goals were a little bit different back then. Um, in 2013, we actually uh, received IRB approval from both MITRE and uh, Purdue's IRB. And then we started our data collection in uh, the, the fall semester of 2013. And that data collection continued to uh, the spring semester this year, um, whereas now we've been in the analysis phase. Uh, our our uh, volunteer participation has been closed. Uh, but we've been doing the analysis on, on the data set. Okay, so the re let me start by giving you a research overview. Um, so the research project is actually called Periodic Mobile Forensics. Um, what we're doing is, um, so we, we originally targeted Android malware um, for, for periodic mobile forensics. Uh, but, but basically what it's morphed into is 
we wanted to, to use uh, mobile and traditional uh, forensic techniques um, and apply them uh, to, to handle uh, certain, certain problems. Um, so I'll go in more into that. Uh, this is the, the paper um, that, that we actually uh, produced and it was published in DFRWS, uh, uh, the, the DFRWS Proceedings for 2013. Um, and it was uh, Digital Investigation 10. Um, and then uh, we've been funded the past few years, and we actually are funded again for uh, 2015. Uh, MITRE actually works by fiscal year, so, so our funding actually just occurred. If you're familiar with the fiscal year, it's a little bit different than, than a, a semester. All right, so let me give you some background on the research. So. Um, Let's go back about uh, five to ten years ago. Um, a lot of a lot of uh, government and industry was using blackberries, and these blackberries uh, they they were the voice um, the the voice data was on the carrier networks, but the blackberries themselves used what's called the BlackBerry Enterprise server. It, this was a a server that could be put inside of an organization or an enterprise. And all of the, the data traffic from that BlackBerry would be funneled through there. That became a point for two things. It became a point for not only um, uh, policy enforcement, but, but also it was an auditing point where, where you can gather information about, about what your users are using those devices for. Um, let's fast forward to the present now. Now we have Androids. We have we have. Apple iPhones. We we have all these new smartphones, um, and nobody wants to use a BlackBerry anymore. Oh, maybe I shouldn't say that, but um, now now the paradigm is different. Uh, the voice is on the carrier network. Data is also on the carrier network. Um, at least that's what the carrier networks are are telling enterprises. Um, so there's a there's a problem with that because an enterprise wants to keep their data safe. And, and the carrier networks are saying, well, you know what, you're using our phones or the, our phones on our, on our network, so, so um, who actually owns the data in that case? Well, in, in my view, it's still, still the enterprise that owns the data. Um, so the, there's these new uh, security companies out there. They're called mobile device managers, and, and they're trying to step in and fill in that void. And, and these mobile device managers, like uh, like Mobile Iron and AirWatch, are, are a few of them. Um, what they're doing is they're they're installing an agent on the on the device, but that agent runs from 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 the Android um, runtime or or the Dalvik virtual machine. So it runs it runs with some with, with some privileges, uh, but only the privileges that uh, a few more privileges than than a regular user application, kind of like Facebook or anything else would would one with. Um, and and about all that they're able to do is they're able to to blacklist applications on these devices. So periodic mobile forensics is it, it is a research project, but we have some technical capabilities. Um, what we're doing is we're providing end device security for for uh, we we are primarily focused with Android devices. Um, there would be no reason why we couldn't do it on 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 other platforms. Um, it's it, but Android. This is a research project, so we're focusing on Android primarily because um, our government customers are are wanting to use Androids more than uh, than than other platforms. Um, and so some of the things that we can do um, is we can verify the, the integrity of, of enterprise mobile devices. Um, we can detect malicious software and, and hardware. Um, and, and we're primarily um, uh, applying these techniques to, to these use cases, the malicious user, a malicious application, um, the masquerading user, um, and the forensics laboratory. Um, some techniques that we use in order to do this um, for the malicious user, we can just we can audit the fully audit the the device and and what the device is used for. Um, 
for malicious applications, we're looking at static analysis. And, and also, that paper that I talked about talks about integrity changes that happen when, you're, when, when um, a, a, a malicious application um, a, a affects a, a mobile device. Um, for the mass grading users, we can, we can apply machine learning, and this is what, we're, what, what I'm going to be uh, focusing our, our analysis on today. Um, and, then, and then we have also, we, we use a concept called differential analysis for the forensics laboratory. Differential analysis is basically we could, we could take a snapshot of the device um, before something happens and then, and then make some change on the device and take a snapshot after and we can compare those two together. So when we're looking at our, our kind of our, our novel approaches or our innovation here, um, what we're able to do is, is we're able to assess integrity um, because we aren't, like, like those other platforms that are running out of the, the Android runtime, uh, we're actually sitting in a, in a different location on, on the device. And, and so we have, we have full access to the device because of where we're sitting. Um, so, so we're able to see those, those integrity changes, whereas, whereas if, if there was a malicious application that broke out of that user space, um, the, those applications that are still in that user space may not be able to see uh, full integrity changes. Um, we're able to, to rebuild uh, the full forensic images of, of these devices, and, and then we can do analysis on top of there. And, and because of how we're doing this, um, what we're doing on the device and then, and then our analysis that we do off the device, this provides us an untampered mechanism. So we're letting the device run the way that it wants to. If, if a, a malicious attacker were going to try to disrupt what we're doing, the device itself isn't, isn't going to work. So we provide this untampered mechanism uh, because we're doing the bulk of the analysis on the back end. So how, how we go about um, restructuring or reconstructing images, um, if we have if we have the, the storage space of, of a mobile device at, at, at time t, all the way on the left there, and then at time t plus 1, um, we observe that that uh, looks, like, looks like four different areas of, of those, those storage devices changed, four different offsets. Um, then if we wanted to rebuild that, all that we do is we substitute in those changed areas um, to, to rebuild that that full picture of the device at time t1. Um, and now at time t2, you see we have three more changes. And um, some of those changes were, were in the same location as, as time t1. What we can do is we could substitute in those changes. And now we have a snapshot of time t2 by, by mixing both t1 and t2's data. Uh, we have secure communication mechanisms. We actually operate uh, utilizing the, the device's mechanisms for, for sending data off. So we could use mobile broadband technologies. It all depends on, on what type of plans these devices have. Uh, we could use uh, Wi-Fi um, actually on, on the campus. We used Wi-Fi. But we could use Bluetooth. We could use NFC if we wanted to, although it would probably be very slow and painful. Um, but uh, it really doesn't matter to us. And actually, we can even use uh, wired connectivity to send it off. The data itself, we've done a lot of work to, to make sure that we can, we can transfer this data because it, sometimes it could be a lot of data, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, we, it goes through a lot of changes. Uh, these changes, not just compression, um, we encode it in different ways, we serialize it, all to be able to send it as fast as we can. And from a scalability standpoint, um, one of the things that we used in the experiment, and, and one, one of the things that, that has been very useful to us is, is we use the Amazon Web Services uh, cloud environments to provide us with um, uh, basic connectivity, uh, ubiquitous connectivity, whenever, whenever we, we wanted it and, and from wherever we wanted it. Um, we actually, uh, funny story, we sent we, we sent out to the campus uh, two, two servers to, that, to get racked here, and 
neither of the servers made it out here working. So um, you see that we had this, this issue that, that um, if we wanted to have something close to here, it, it becomes a, this logistical nightmare that, that, uh, that Amazon Web Services was easily able for us to, us to solve. Um, so it, that, that's, that's a great thing about the cloud. I, I'm convinced that, that the cloud is good now, I guess. Um, so, and, and if we wanted to scale, um, there's, there's easy ways that we can scale this. So we can have as many queues as we want. Uh, we can have as many queuing services as we want. Uh, we can have as many clouds as we want. Uh, we, can, we can then have databases on the clouds and we can scale those both vertically and horizontally. Um, so, so it doesn't matter where our data is, we, we have processes for moving this data around. Any questions so far? Maybe this is relevant at this point, um, but what exactly is this this system? You know, is it, is it a kernel module? Where I guess where in the in the stack does it reside? It sounds like it's below the standard Android application. It is below the standard Android applications, but that's only in our implementation. Um, the, how we implemented it was it's a system service. Okay. Um, so so it was running. It, it's it was just a service on on the device, and and so what we were trying to do is we were trying to make it so that we we modified the phone as little as possible from stock. Hmm. So the only thing that it's doing besides um, the the stock build that that was on there is running our 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 system service. Um, besides that, so. We wanted to try to, to keep it like that. Um, sure. it, had we gone in, we could we could have done a kernel module. We could have done um, a bunch of uh, different things. Actually, um, there's uh, uh, one of one of uh, my past interns in in the room actually <laughs> coded up uh, some kernel support for this um, during when when he was an intern, mm. and and we we ended up. We ended up not using it, utilizing that code because we didn't want to get away from that stock build. Sure, sure. Thanks. So, there's a lot of different use cases that, that we've looked at for, for this research. Um, we've looked at the, uh, the enterprise use case. Uh, there's also a, a virtualized use case where, where we're operating in a thin client architecture. We can do that. And then there's those forensics laboratory use cases. And we're primarily going to going to talk about that masquerading user use case um, from from the enterprise. Um, but it, let me just jump in and 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 talk about this. Uh, so on the device itself, what we do is our agent doesn't need root, um, but our agent is started up as a system service. It's actually owned by a net. So that gives us the privileges for us to be able to to um, go and measure the the block device changes. Um, so we're able to touch the block devices. We're able to read the block devices. We can actually write back to the block devices if we wanted to. Um, but um, we we aren't technically, and we don't need to have the device rooted. We can actually operate um, with the device uh, operating normally. Um, so. That's a that's a big win when we're going out and, and talking to somebody about maybe adopting this. All right, so let's jump into the the experiment now. So we had this this enterprise capability. Well, originally we had a, a laboratory capability. We did that that um, the malware. Uh, research, and then and then we we started developing this enterprise capability, and we wanted to get to the point where where we tested it. Um, so, MITRE is, is is such that our our government customers that that we have um, it's it's sometimes difficult to to test out these these types of scenarios. Um, we also had a, a relationship with with Purdue um, where we wanted to. We wanted to to do this type of collaboration, um, so so these are th these are some of the motivations that we had for for doing this, um, and then 
and then we wanted to be able to to validate that our that our capabilities and uh, and our usage of this data is it is going to be um, valid and and usable. So what we what we decided to do was we decided to to uh, focus in on on the masquerading user or masquerader. And on mobile devices, these are a little bit different, especially on enterprise mobile devices. So a masquerading user is, is defined as somebody other than the, the enterprise-issued phone user. So um, mobile devices are different than, than laptops. Um, a laptop, if an enterprise, ish, if a company issues you a laptop, um, typically they would, you would have a profile, you'd be on Active Directory, um, you know, you'd, you, you'd have this, this profile that you can log in to, to the computer network with. Well, well these, these uh, mobile devices are different. They're inherently single user devices. And, and what, what we assume on these devices is that is that we're going to give it to an, an enterprise user and it's that enterprise user that is going to be using it. Um, so so I went home one day and I, I left my phone on, on, on the, the kitchen counter and my son comes along and and he grabbed my phone and he he went out and and he wanted to to install a game and he ended up finding a, a snow cone making app on, on Google Play. Uh, I don't know why you would want to make snow cones with mobile devices, but there is an app for that. Um, so, so he goes and he and he grabs that, and in the process, what he did was he completely clicked click past any security mechanism that my device had for for um, for allowing apps to be installed. Because um, if if I was going to be looking at that, well, number one, I, I wouldn't have downloaded a snow cone making app on my uh, on a work phone. Uh, but number two, um, they, I have to go through and I have to say, hey, I want to I want to allow this app to to have these permissions, and and so I wasn't even able to look at what those permissions were. Um, those permissions could have been anything from accessing the camera to leaving the phone on to to having full capabilities to to wipe the phone. So um, apps that you know, why would a why would a flashlight app need to be able to to read your files? I don't know, but um, you know these types of things exist out there, and, and some of it is some of it's just for advertising, but uh, but definitely um, this is to to an enterprise um, there a masquerading user, whether it's whether it's a child or whether it's actually this evil maid here. Um, that is, you know, you leave your your phone in a hotel room, and the, the the maid comes in and starts trying to access your your resources or, or do something else on there. Um, to an enterprise, all masqueraders are bad. Um, so, originally back in 2012, and I, I think I actually had this this slide in in the DAC um, in for my 2012 presentation. Um, Originally, this is what we were we were looking at in terms of an approach for for an experiment, and we wanted to we wanted to swap the devices between users on the campus, and that basically that basically uh, was a non-starter. Um, the privacy aspects of of doing something like that would would uh, would make that a non-starter. Uh, so we had to find a, a different way of going about it. So what we did was was we de we decided to split this into two phases. We had uh, a collection phase and, and then an analysis phase. And the collection phase, we were we were looking at um, utilizing 35 um, smartphones to do this, and, and presumably we would have about 35 volunteers. Um, the volunteers would get the the usage of the Galaxy S3 phones. Um, a, an AT&T plan, uh, it was unlimited talk, text, data, um, and then I also, I, I, I purposely added tethering and Wi-Fi hotspotting, although I don't know that anybody knew that. I didn't, I didn't say that, so I don't know if anybody found that or not. But, um, and, and then what we did was, was we, we provided the volunteers with a, an acceptable use policy, and it was a very simple 
um, weak acceptable use policy. Uh, that policy basically said, hey, think of yourself as, as members of a company and, and this company is, has provided you with a phone and um, you basically just don't do anything to break the phone is, is it was basically what we were saying. Um, and we added it to the, the volunteers consent form. Uh, what we were actually telling them is uh, we used a little bit of deception and I'll go in, into that. Um, but the, the volunteers were actually thinking that we were looking at uh, application usage. And then we had um, an analysis phase uh, where what we're gonna, what we ultimately decided to do was was take a look at this and and utilize the IDs. If we had to do any any swapping of data, it would be all done in the back end. So our deception uh, problem was this: we wanted the volunteers to use these phones normally. Uh, actually, the the IRBs had, had some difficulty with this concept. Um, we were saying, all we want to do is have the, have the phones used normally. And they were like, you, you mean you don't want to experiment on the, on the users? No, we don't. Uh, we wanted them just to use it normally. Um, we wanted to generate this. Uh, so th the issue is, if we told the volunteers that we were doing a masquerading user experiment, well, well our, our thoughts were that they might try to purposely change their behavior to screw up our masquerading, uh, our masquerading tests. Um, so, so instead what we did was we just said, there, we, we've got applications, we, we've provided you with a bunch of applications if you want, want to put more on. Um, and basically there's something running on there and, and we, we had surveys set up so that, so that all, all the way through there was a weekly survey that the volunteers had to fill out. And, and the surveys asked questions like, did you notice anything different with the phone? Well, in actuality, we didn't change anything with the phone. But uh, some volunteers said they noticed it. It was probably more, more than likely something that they did. Um, so um, when, we, when we finally uh, finished the, the data collection, um, we provided the, uh, the volunteers with a post-session consent form. And this post-session consent form uh, spilled the beans about, about everything that we were doing and had them, they had to sign off on actually utilizing their data for this experiment. So that's how we ended up running it. So let me give you a, an idea of how this worked. So PMF was started, it was installed on these devices. It was it started by init. Um, it's a system service. And um, it's just continually scanning in the background as these, these users are, are using the device. Um, and then when we had this schedule, and we didn't, we wanted to be somewhat non-obtrusive. Uh, so uh, our schedule was every 24 hours, um, it would it would send data. I think the scans were were occurring um, every every four hours. It would it would try to do do a scan, and if the phone was sleeping, uh, then it's going to continue sleeping because nothing's happening on the device. So. The phone would have to wake up, and then it, and then there would be a check that's done. The check is done every 30 seconds or something like that. Hey, is there a scan that needs to happen? And then and then that the the scan would keep the phone awake for for as long as, as the scan occurs. Um, we actually have two scans. The the first scan uh, is is a full scan of the device, and, and so the the users could could actually. Um, they, they could actually turn off the device or seemingly turn off the device where it looks like the device is off. Uh, but uh, what happens is it actually goes into a partial wake clock state. state. And, and this partial wake clock, um, it turns off the actual screen of the device, but, but the device itself is still processing. And it's fin going to finish our scan, and then it goes to sleep after that. We, we release the wake clock, and the phone goes to sleep. We also have another scan that is a, a short scan, and that's based off of, of previous data that we've collected on longer scans. Uh, so the short scan, we only target areas of the device that potentially could occur, 
and the, and, and the short scan is obviously a lot faster. We could actually get through an entire 16 gigabyte device. We can do that in about two to three minutes um, so for, for that short scan. So, so we, we, have a, we, we, we utilize those two different scans. And then if there was, if there was, a, that, if there was a, a lapse of that 24 hour time frame, then we would try to, to send the data. Uh, we use Amazon Web Services Cloud environment, and I, so I, I actually put Amazon Web Services out in out in the the Washington area because we were actually using Amazon Gov Cloud. So um, our this was this is one one thing um, we're able to use Gov Cloud as as MITRE. Um, we have we have enterprise agreements with with Amazon, and, and so. This provides us a, a, a little um, added security. We were, you know, GovCloud is is actually um, it's FedRAMP certified for for the federal government, so that's what we were utilizing, and it's based in in, in uh, Washington. And we still didn't necessarily trust putting data out out in the cloud, so everything is encrypted going out to the cloud. And it's also encrypted at rest when 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 it's when it's out in the cloud. At the cloud, we we deduplicate the data, and and uh, we went through all those transformations that we were talking about. Um, and then, the data doesn't stay out in the cloud for very long. It actually doesn't. It only needs to stay out in the cloud for for a matter of minutes because what happens is we have a process. That is initiated from MITRE over in Virginia, and and it it syncs our database um, from a, a, a secure enclave in MITRE um, out to the cloud, and it pulls that data data back down. In the process of pulling it down, though, uh, sync is probably a bad word because what happens is as we pull it over from from um, the the cloud back to MITRE, we're actually decrypting the data. Uh, on the way, so that when we when we have it back in in MITRE, the data is fully decrypted. And now we have all this data in the in this secure enclave uh, back at MITRE, and we can reconstruct these images. We could utilize PMF um, to to reconstruct them, and then we can do analysis on there. And so that's basically, in a nutshell, how we how we ran the collection phase of this. Um, so this is an this is a, an actual architecture of what we built, and and the the top four phones, we can call that the Purdue Area LAN or the what is it, the PAL? I think we were on PAL 2.0, uh, I guess. Um, and then and then um, these bottom phones were were from MITRE. So this these were the only areas that were uh, only two LANs that we we let uh, talk to our our cloud environment. Um, so. So no other area could could talk to um, to the cloud. Uh, we had we had our queuing services up on the cloud, and and they really didn't work very hard at all. To be honest with you, um, we could have taken a lot more data into the cloud, but we'll we'll talk about that. Um, and then, uh, like I said, we synced the databases between the cloud and and our our secure enclave. Whereas then we were able to do our, our secure data. Um, that that IPY there, um, if you guys are familiar with it, it's IPython. Um, we actually had IPython environments to do some some analytics, and I'll I'll talk about that. Uh, but we had a, a production environment. Uh, we did some integration work uh, while we were waiting for some uh, of the consent forms to be to be signed, um, and then and then we had our development environments. Uh, so, just to make sure that we were protecting this data appropriately, um, we did have public key encryption uh, for all the data at rest. Um, so it wasn't until the data was pulled over that it was decrypted. Um, it is the data is still sitting in in a MITRE secure enclave that only only certain MITRE staff are are allowed into, um, and this enclave is is uh, firewalled, and we actually. Have to access it through through uh, SSH tunneling, and then uh, 
in terms of our data usage, what, one of the things that we told the IRB that we weren't going to do is we weren't going to use certain content. Uh, so uh, we, we went through and, and instead of usernames, uh, we use identifiers uh, for, for just about every, everything. Um, and, then, and then as we extract data, there's a certain point that where, where we have automated processes, and those automated processes um, extract data in a certain way so that when, when we're actually going to put physical eyes on it, uh, on the data, uh, only what is, what is visible to us is what we want to be visible to us. We, we aren't, we aren't going to go and pass the content back in uh, so that researchers can look at it because we said we weren't going to use that. Any questions? All right, so let's talk about the results of the data collection. So there's, there's the data collection. Um, and we were relatively uh, trying, trying not to, to be obtrusive. Um, we, we didn't require uh, the users to be on the campus for weekends or, or holidays. Um, but we, we, left, uh, we left the our queuing service up and running. So if a phone was on the campus, and the, the phone would phone in during the weekend, and, and we'd, we'd get that collection, or at least try to complete that collection. So we ended up collecting 1,000, uh, 1,010 forensic images. And, and um, the, in terms of uh, full communications, we collected 872 of them. So we had 138 that, that were failed communications. Uh, uh, gives us a completion rate of 87 uh, percent, but after after that failed attempt, it might have been just that the the person wasn't on campus for very long, or the person might have stepped into an elevator, uh, you know, and we, we lost the communication uh, attempt. Um, but after after at least one uh, more attempt, uh, we completed all of the the communications, um, which is which is very good. We we ended up working on on this a lot and, and actually what was even more concerning to me and I, w I was hammering my, my team about this is, uh, well before we get into that, let me show you this, the, the weekly heat map uh, of when, these, when this, these collections occurred. Um, and so you see largely it was, it, it was uh, during, during uh, school hours that it, that it, where it occurred. Now, what is interesting about this? It is in GMT, so you got to move the data a little bit. So, so we we had a, a few hours in the morning. You, we can tell that these are college students, so uh, um, you know, didn't didn't like morning classes, I guess. So, all right. So, what was more concerning was large data set communications, and. Um, Another, another funny story that we can look back on it right now. So Eric Katz was my coordinator. And um, after, we, after we got uh, um, approved by, by Purdue's IRB, we were, we were quickly provisioning these phones to get them sent out. And one of the things that we did on, on six of our phones was so we, we typically would take a gold image of, of the phone. It's kind of a starting point of the phone that we could base, base um, off of. We don't need to take it on every phone. We could, we could just take the image on, on one phone if we wanted to. Uh, but we, we ended up running it through to make sure that, that the, the images were completing on the device. Well, so we ended up uh, getting to the point where, where these images were, were completed back at back on, on MITRE's campus, and we ended up um, turning off, off the phones uh, after that. And, and what happens is there needs to be a, a cycle there. Just a, it, it was more of a timing thing, whereas we didn't reset. It's, it's basically like one bit that has to get flipped on our, on our devices. And, and because we turned them off right after we completed them, um, we, we needed to do those, those six again. So. We actually sent these phones out to campus, and we didn't realize this until Eric was handing out these phones to, to users. So all of a sudden, we had to send 16 gigabytes of data off, and the users were already using it for, for, six, for six devices. I think we might have 
I think we might have short-circuited one or two of those devices. Uh, they hadn't been handed out yet, and, it, and Eric started up the rest of them and let him, let him finish. But, but um, all, all of the, the ones that, that had this, this issue, um, they ended up completing on the campus while, while a user was using them. Um, and then we were also worried that, that we would give out these phones and, and maybe a user would want to go and throw a bunch of movies on or throw a bunch of MP3s, you know, do whatever they wanted. And, and we wanted to see this happen. Um, and well, we did see it happen. In 25 cases, there was, there was communications that were, that were greater than, than two gigabytes. Now, now, that data is all going to get compressed. So it's not two gigabytes that, that or greater than two gigabytes that we have to send over, over the network. But I, I can't tell you how big it was. Um, we didn't go looking into how much data we actually transferred. Um, because it would be compressed, and we went through all those different transformations with the data. But our largest one was, was uh, what is that, uh, 11,259 11, megabytes. So it, these devices, that, that's almost filling up the, the uh, user space on these devices. So um, that, that was probably you know, a bunch of movies and, and a bunch of, uh, bunch of, of whatever uh, in one, one big attempt. And then we had to send all that data over. And what was... What was really telling was we built in a bunch of, of redundancies, uh, redundant mechanisms for this, um, so, so, that, so that if we had a break in the communication, we would basically pick back up where, where we had. And um, so we only had one failed communication attempt on, on that data before it sent all 11,000 uh, 11, megabytes up to our, to our server, and we were able to collect that. So once it gets up to, to the, the cloud, we go through a process called single instancing, which is basically just a fancy way of saying deduplicating the data. Um, so 1,160 snapshots, if you, if you add our, our initial gold images to that 1,110 1, or, or 1, um, images that we collected, um, times 16 gigabytes, that, that gives us about 17 terabytes of data that we would have had to send had we, had we uh, just sent all the data that we could. Um, instead, we had 595 gigabytes of encrypted data out in the cloud. Um, and, and remember, that data was, wa was getting reduced all the time. So, so it wasn't even fully 595 gigabytes that, were, that was out there. Um, and then our analytical database size ended up being, and, and still is, 325 gigabytes uh, of data. So this is, this is a big win. It's the difference between something that's going to take us all day and something that's going to take us a few minutes to do um, when we're talking about this. And 50 times reduction in storage. We couldn't, we couldn't um, ask for anything better. Any questions? Before we jump into the analysis, all right. So we had all this the the 17 terabytes of data, or the equivalent of the 17 terabytes of data. Um, we had references to all that. So what we can do is we can easily just issue a command and rebuild these images. And we ended up doing that. We, after post session consent forms, we had we had one or two people that we couldn't use. Um, for various reasons, uh, I think I think one denied his consent. One dropped out of the protocol early. Um, so we we were able to collect, we were able to use 750 images um, in our secure enclave. So we rebuilt these images, and then we extracted audit events from it. And we were able to extract over 1.1 million audit events from it. Um, we we developed a bunch of processes for this for this audit extraction, and these are really forensic processes that are going in and and looking at at data on the device and lifting this data off. There's a number of ways we can do it, and, and a number of different different means that we could do. Uh, we can we can lift off all the files if we wanted to on on the device. Um, so any changed file we can identify, uh, any deleted file, uh, if as long as that, that file hasn't been written back over, 
the, the file data is still, still on the storage device and we can lift that off, just the inode is, is not there. Um, we can identify uh, any geolocation data uh, on the devices. Um, we can collect and we can parse installed APKs. So we could see when it was installed. We can immediately lift those off and we can do a bunch of static analysis to the APKs. We can look for things like, um, like malicious intents, uh, like uh, the boot completed intent or anything like that. That's from the first malware uh, paper that we did. Um, and then we can assess the integrity of, of these devices. Uh, so the boot image uh, holds your kernel. The recovery image actually has another kernel on there um, that that could be could be modified by an attacker. Um, it's not not as much a a um, target of attacks, but then you have the bootloader, which is which is device specific. So so this one you definitely don't want changing anyway. And then there's the system image, which holds all your your system files. This is basically what's what's uh, operating your device, all, all the data on there. So you don't want that to change. Typically, if this changes on an enterprise, the enterprise ought to know what it is. So that's what we were going for. We could gather camera usage, um, pictures, videos, screenshots, and, and we have a variety of others. Um, one detector that's really interesting that, that we built um, is an application usage detector. So it turns out that Android um, your Android device will will store in a file uh, that's written to every 30 minutes by the device. It'll it'll store a bunch of usage statistics for your applications, and it's rotated daily. Um, the previous five days are stored, and it doesn't store start time and end times, but it stores the amount of time that you use the device, and um, it also it stores the the amount of times that you used it during the day. Um, so this is significant data that we can we can start to profile uh, usage patterns with. This all had to be decoded, by the way. It's actually stored in a file on the device, um, but but that file is a, a binary file. It's not like we could go in and just just read it. So so um, where we are in the experiment is. Um, Right here, the green is pretty much what, what we've done. And um, we're going to talk about these, these last boxes, the generating sessions, feature extractors, and, and masquerading uh, detectors. So in terms of a session, um, if a session is basically if we can put a start and an end time on, onto a a person's usage patterns. Um, so, so uh, you know, you take out your, your smartphone out of your pocket. You you hit the hit the the unlock button. Um, you know, maybe you maybe you unlock it. You got to swipe your your pattern in there. Maybe maybe you do the the facial recognition there. Um, you smile. I got blink detection on mine. It doesn't really work, but it makes me look foolish when I do it. Um, so. And then, and then you use it for a certain period of time. You use certain applications for a while, and then, and then once, once you're done, you know, you hit the hit the lock button. You put it back in your pocket. So that's one session of data that we want to align our data to. And, and so we went down three different ways of building sessions. Um, the daily sessions um, would just be would just be daily sessions of, of usage where we where we we take an entire day's data, put it together. There's hourly sessions um, that, that that are broken up throughout the throughout our, our protocol time. And then our event initiated sessions, which would be just that. You, you there's some event that initiated that session. It could be a could be a phone call too. Now those sessions um, that are that are phone calls. Those aren't those aren't actually user initiated sessions. Those are there's some outside um, outside force that's initiating that. Another another person's calling calling in there. When we really started looking at the experimentation, though, if we could if we can go down the road of generating these sessions, um, then all that we wanted to do is we wanted to say, for each session that we had, is this session actually the user that we think it is? Um, so is it is it from the user that we issued the phone to, or is it not? And if we can determine that, 
then that's masquerading detection. We've, we've determined it. We don't, we don't have to identify the other masquerader. We just have to identify that it's not our user that we think it is based off of their, their usage pattern and the differences there. So this ends up being a binary classification that we can do. And now, now when, it's, when it's a binary classification, we can start to apply different machine learning techniques to it. So I'm going to show uh, next three slides. I'm going to show some weekly usage patterns from, from three phones. And these, these three phones are significant. They, they actually have just about the same amount of sessions. I think uh, in terms of, of hourly sessions, there was about 1,600 sessions for each of them. Now, obviously, they, they didn't match completely. Um, but they were right around uh, 1,600 <laughs> sessions throughout the, throughout the protocol that we pulled. Um, so this is, uh, this is the first phone. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is for all phones. I'm sorry. Um, and, and remember, this is, uh, this is GMT again. So, so you've got to slide it down a little bit. So that, that um, kind of the light spot in the morning, that ends up being the actual, the actual morning during class time. So kind of interesting. Um, it, you know, much, much more usage uh, throughout, throughout the... Uh, the afternoon and and towards the nighttime. It was during finals, right? Everybody was studying. Right? Sure. All right. So here's the three phones. So the first phone is for for phone number eight. Okay. Now now you see that in terms of, of this usage pattern and and remember to to twist it a little bit. But this usage pattern, um, the second half of the week was 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 very busy. For this, and it was it was pretty constant in, in terms of this. So let's look at 15. For 15, um, Friday night was was the most busy. There was a lot of studying time for those Saturday tests. Um, so so Friday night is is definitely the most uh, busy part. And and now 28, the the good student, um, this good student, Thursday night. Um, definitely was was the most busy. So, just looking at these these three different phones, um, if I were to give you a session time and just say this is this is when this session occurred, you could probably take an educated guess based off of these three pictures about when that that session occurred. And that's really all that we're doing. Only we're going to do it at a, at a scale. We're going to use algorithms to do it uh, more than than just just uh, looking at, at, at patterns. And we're going to do it for a lot more data. So um, we're going to generate features that we're going to align to our sessions. And, and these features are based off of this audit data. We, we pull out um, data. We started with um, emails, calls, and, and SMS messages communication events from from or to the user of the device only. And, and we generated a bunch of features off of there. There's things like hour of the day, um, day of the week. So, uh, and then the amount of incoming um, messages, the amount of incoming calls, the amount of outgoing, um, the number of words in an SMS session, um, things like that. And, and remember, we're, we're not using the um, we're not using the actual words uh, because we said we weren't going to use the, con uh, uh, the content. So what we're doing is we're actually hashing that, that data. And then we're looking at things like term frequency, inverse document frequency, um, things like that where we could, we, we could get a number that we could pass in and we can train off of. And we align those features to, to those sessions that we had extracted before. Here's our classifiers that, that we ended up utilizing. Um, and, and some of these classifiers are better than others uh, at, at, at classifying this. Um, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to take these combinations of, of the proper features, and we're going to marry it up with, with, our, with our, our, our what we call mass grading detectors, but they're really just classifiers, um, and, and see which ones uh, provide us with the best answer. So how, how we, we actually evaluate this is um, we have currently two techniques, and we're working on a third. 
So the, the first technique is, is just a pairing technique. If we have, if we have a thousand phones in our, in, in our, our enterprise and we want to do this, then we're going to make 500 pairs of, of phones. And it, and it really doesn't matter, although it, it would be nice to, to pair up um, two distinct phones. If you have two phones that, that look very similar, then this technique won't work very well. But for the most part, it, what, we're, what we end up doing is, is we just pick at random two phones and we're going to train off of those phones. And so then we're just going to ask the question, for this session that we think is from phone A, is it from phone A or is it from phone B? Uh, does it look more like phone A or does it look like phone, phone B? Second one is, is a, a virtual um, pair. So we have, we have phones and we have all this other data in our data set. And what we do is, is if that phone has, let's say, let's say a bunch of, of sessions with, with a bunch of data in it, we, we go into that, that non-phone data set and, and we pull out a bunch of that data and we make a, a virtual pair uh, out, of, out of the data that's in there uh, with the thinking that that's going to look, look distinctive because it's going to be all the rest of the phone data and, and this phone is going um, to be distinct uh, paired against it. Um, and, then, and then what we do is, is we simply um, end up passing it in here. We, we generate uh, what's called the area under the curve um, for rock curves. And, and uh, this area under the curve, what we obviously want to do is we want to we have more area under the curve because that pushes, up, pushes us all the way up into, into that proper, into, into our proper space on the, on the curve. Um, and, and we can average the, the results across there to figure out how, how this particular algorithm with, this fe with these features do. So uh, obviously um, the, the pairing, just, just having a pair, um, you could have, you could have uh, a, a session that you end up passing in that isn't from phone A or phone B and maybe it's from phone C, and that could throw off your results because it, the phone C phone, you're going to actually make a decision if it looks a little bit, if it looks like phone A or if it looks like phone B, but in, in actuality it's not either. Um, the, the virtual pair gives us a little bit better answer, and we're actually look, working on another one, which would be a, a voting mechanism, um, and that voting mechanism may provide us with better answers uh, to that. But. So how we did this um, is, is we, we built a framework and, and a test harness in, in IPython. And we used uh, a, a bunch of, of available um, uh, modules to, to IPython. And it provides us an excellent platform for doing this, not just for generating rock curves or, or charts or graphs, but also we take advantage of, of widgets to be able to slide different parameters back and forth in our in our harness so that we can easily effect a change in our harness and then and then the tests will just keep going. Um, here's our here's our evaluation framework and really how it works is we we generate for for each feature set and and uh, masquerading uh, set of masquerading detectors. Uh, we generate a notebook, and this notebook ends up being either either that paired uh, notebook, that that paired algorithm, or the virtual pair pair algorithm. And then um, we we can either run the notebook itself, or we can we can from a what we call a runner, we can we can automate the running of the notebook. And then we we chart on on our leaderboard uh, which which uh, um, feature sets and, and, and algorithms are, are doing the best. So in terms of analytical out outcomes, um, this is what we want to come out with is we want to determine the best features and, and the best classifiers that are going to work based on our, our data. And then um, we want to be able to turn this into a repeatable process. So this we're doing after the fact, 
But if we were going to actually do this when, when we were collecting the data, um, we might have to, to modify the way that we're doing this. We might have to have an, a, an approach to training where we're, we're kind of doing a sliding window for, for the training. Um, so, um, and then we also wanted to evaluate, is there any of this data that, that we can push back to the device and we can evaluate this onto the device to perhaps make, make some, some response decisions right, right on the device. Let's say, let's say you leave your, your phone in a hotel room and um, the, the maid does come in and grabs your phone and starts manipulating your phone. Well, after a certain period of time, if we can evaluate that, that, that behavior right on the device, then maybe we, can, maybe we can shut off the device or shut off access to the network resources that that, that maid might have been able to get into when they started. That would be the, the goal of, of doing this. All right, so just as a status, um, our participation, our volunteer participation is closed. Uh, but uh, we, we did apply for, for continuation to both MITRES and Purdue's IRBs, and, and we were granted that. We were actually granted it, um, Purdue's IRB, on, on August 25th. Um, so we have another another year of, of utilizing the data, um, and then we're we're in the process of evaluating which which features work best. And um, we're gonna right now we are working on communication events, but but the the idea would be we might have to to widen that scope if if we don't if we don't get good enough data, um, and so we're still working on it at this point. Um, Are there any questions? How do you control for, or did you have an instrument to control for um, possible masquerading users in your data set? For instance, a lot of us just give our phones to other people for taking pictures or for texting when we can't ourselves. We didn't. We didn't have a anything that said that that you couldn't do that. Um, well, we we did have in our in our consent forms that we wanted them to be the users of, of the device, but there was nothing to stop them from sharing those devices. Um, but we're we're making the assumption that that the devices were mostly used by our, our users, and if there's one session that that was used by another another person, I, I think I think our, our results will will survive, and they'll still be usable results. Uh, you know, if a, if, a, if a person ended up giving it to somebody else for the entire protocol, well, we don't really care who that, who, who is the user of the device as it is. So as long as that, that user's activity was consistent, then, then we, could, we could utilize that too. Um, now, now um, we'd, still, we'd still be protecting their privacy and everything like that. I actually, besides knowing knowing the names because of getting a copy of the cons consent forms, I had I had no idea who who the who the volunteers were that were utilizing the device, and and we aren't we aren't utilizing any of that data, so it really doesn't matter to us if that makes if that makes sense. Another question: um, When you're looking at masquerading users um, in general in the wild, your masquerading user doesn't necessarily have a profile, you don't know who that person is. So um, was that the purpose of the two different binary classifications, the X versus Y and the X versus everything else? Or do you have another way to capture that? Yeah, so, so we, obviously what, what we're trying to do is we're, we're just trying to identify the actual user that we know and not, not identify the, the masquerader. You know, they don't have a, pro, uh, a profile. But what we can identify is that it's not the user that we think it is. And, and so um, we're utilizing those two, um, th those two different, different uh, approaches because the first approach, the, the pairing approach, is the one we started with. Um, it has the weakness that, that if, if one of the sessions is from an entirely different phone, it's still going to look like phone A or for phone B. So, if it's from phone C, 
it's got that weakness. But our thought was, if we if we had that virtual pair, then we would be able to uh, better identify a, a distinct phone because because it'd be a pair of all the rest of the the phones. So it would it would more generally look like the behavior uh, of uh, that we've we've observed. At least that was the thought. Okay. Thank you. There was another question. Uh, how often were were the the scans uh, run on the phone, and how did you decide when to start them? So the scans were run um, about every four hours, and and um, it was there was a process that was just running on on the device that would. Uh, evaluate uh, the timing every I think it was every 30 seconds so it was just a loop on the device that was that was saying have we have we passed that four hour mark where we have to do a scan now if the device was sleeping for four hours or let's say the device was sleeping for six hours then the scan isn't going to start up and run it wasn't until the device is woken up that then that process would run the process would run in the in the time frame that that device was awake um, and and at least evaluate once when when the device is awake and then and then um, would basically uh, it, the the process would say have have I passed the time frame where I have to do a scan have I passed the time frame where I have to send send my data and it would evaluate that and go through our algorithms at that point Um, well, so what we want to do um, again, we we don't we don't, we we have some preliminary results right now, but um, we're still working on getting our results uh, better. But the idea would be that we want to be able to do this on on every session that we can we can make. So so we can evaluate those user event initiated sessions. Um, we want to be able to pass those event initiated sessions in there, and those event initiated sessions might be, you know, for a span of of 30 seconds that that session, but there's going to be some limit there because that that 30 second time frame there might not have been many many features that we can extract for for that session. So um, that's that's one of the things that we have to de to determine is is how many sessions it takes for us to train on. And then how many sessions we uh, how how often we can evaluate that? But we're we're trying to do it with distinct sessions. And and we, so far our data our data set is is proving proving promising for hourly sessions at least. We, there's enough data that happens in an hourly session. You know it might be an hourly session could be three or four event initiated sessions or more. Uh, it all depends. Or it could be just one long event initiated session. Um, so uh, right now hourly sessions are, are, are doing pretty well for us um, but, but again they're, we're going to have to get to the point if, if we don't have we obviously aren't going to be hundred percent accurate on this we want to be as close to hundred percent as we can um, but if we were going to take some action on the device that's where we might not want to take the action until We've maybe gone through and evaluated this a few times, maybe. Um, so it all depends on how operationally we would put this into a into effect. Right now, we're still kind of on the research side. Mm, I want to know if the forensic image uh, involves the user's privacy uh, information and uh, how to protect the user's information during the data stored and the, the data process. How how do we protect the user's information? Pri pri privacy information. Yes. Yes. So there's there's a variety of uh, potential privacy information uh, that that private information that we could use, and uh, and uh, what we said was that we weren't going to be using certain information. So um, during the the collection, the data collection, it was relatively easy for us to. Um, to collect the data and then and then secure it at, as it as it transited all the way to to our secure enclave, um, and and so that's what we we did there. But when we get to the analytics, 
that's where potentially our researchers could be exposed to that data. And so what we did was we had a bunch of automated processes that, that would would transform the data in some cases if we, you know, we weren't going to use, we said we weren't going to use SMS content. Um, so what we did was we, we hashed that SMS content um, and the hashes were, were, were able to be, to be utilized. So, so that we weren't exposing ourselves to, to whatever messages were sent back and forth, but we, instead we saw, you know, a bunch of garbly gook and, and, and what we had was, was the number of times that, that those hashes were, were used, for instance. Um, so we were doing those types of, of things where we were either transforming the data or we just said we weren't going to utilize that data at all and we, and we didn't pass it in to where a, in, an examiner can actually see that, that data. So it wasn't extracted, essentially, from, from the, from, from the um, images. Any other questions? Thank you very much. I appreciate it.